Welcome to another episode of the On The Water Podcast. I'm Jimmy Fee. I've got Anthony DeCicci with me here. And this week's guest is going to be Joe Cermelli of the Cut and Retie Podcast. Back in December, we actually went down there and recorded a podcast with Joe for his Cut and Retie Podcast. While we were down there, we interviewed him for an episode of the On The Water Podcast. But the ultimate goal of that trip was to get out and film an episode of At The Rail. Fail. It wasn't, oh, it wasn't our fault. The weather uh, conspired against us. December was an incredibly windy month. Uh, the, the sea conditions were, were brutal. And I, I think we got pushed maybe three times. We were supposed to film aboard the Voyager out of Point Pleasant, New Jersey, going far offshore, you know, 40 to 50 miles offshore, targeting big black sea bass. Ugh. And uh, I mean, the big sea bass that you see inshore in New England in the winter, spend the winter at these deep water... Uh, excuse me, in the summer, they're inshore in the summer, they spend the winter at wrecks in 150 to 200 feet of water, but you have a narrow window to catch them. That that season, it really gets going in December, but then they close the sea bass season on January 1st. Yep. So when we got canceled a couple times in a row for that trip, we had to pivot and do some uh, Pollock fishing a little closer to home. That episode, uh, you can see on our YouTube channel. But anyhow... Even though we were disappointed we didn't get to go fishing on that trip, we had a great conversation with Joe talking about some of the lesser loved species that nonetheless are pretty high on, on our hit lists for 2023. So for the introduction to this podcast, we polled the good followers of the On The Water Instagram account and asked them what fish do they really want to catch this coming season? What's at the top of their list? And uh, Cheech, some of, the, uh, some of the answers were kind of predictable. Giant bluefin tuna, striped bass, um, Somebody wrote uh, Norwegian Ridgeback, which I had to look up. That's a uh, that's a dragon from Harry Potter. Wow. You probably knew that, though. I had no idea. You definitely knew it. Uh, Double-digit Fluke was one. Ooh. Halibut was another one. Ooh. And one of my favorites was from Uncle Duke, who's... Uh, Uncle Duke! Oh, yeah, man. He's a kayak fisherman from Connecticut, and he wants a New, England co- a New England cobia. Don't we all, Uncle Duke, don't we all? I would settle for a New Jersey cobia. Or New York one, and that seemed to be more of a reality uh, than ever before. Last it is year. starting to become a species that you know Long Island and, and New Jersey can start to target some, and we actually have ha- had seen some catches further north. Um, a buddy of mine's uncle was soaking a, a bunker chunk, and uh, right at the end of the beach here from our office, uh, caught a cobia, like you know twenty eight, thirty inch cobia, right in the surf. That's crazy. Yeah, you hear of one or two every year up in uh, as far north as Massachusetts, Rhode Island. They see them. Uh, somebody got one in the Taunton River this year. Yeah, also that's on nuts. a bunker chunk. That's so nuts. maybe that's the uh, maybe that's the key is the bunker chunk. I'm gonna get Bob up here. Bluefin tuna off a kayak. Uh, a young fisherman by the name of Howie Donalds. He wants to do that. Now that was that's been done. Out of Cape Cod, uh, a guy launching off the beach. I can't remember his name now, but he was, that was all the rage in like 2011. This guy was going out there in his kayak and it was a paddle kayak. Yeah. It wasn't even a pedal kayak. Like, that was insane. He had a sit inside paddle kayak. Like I, I can understand doing it today in, in some of the bigger, you know, old town kayaks, especially the ones uh, like the uh, autopilot yeah. where you have the assist from the electric motor. Absolutely. That doesn't seem as much of a stretch, but this guy was doing it in a sit inside con- uh, kayak and he did have some success, but I, I think uh, his last trip he was coming in, saw a great white shark because those numbers in between 2011 <laughs> and now, you know, 2023, we've seen a major increase in the numbers of great white sharks around Cape Cod. And uh, he saw one on his way in from one of the trips and said, that was it. I yeah, think he sold no his loss. kayak and moved back to Chicago or wherever he was from. <laughs> Not a bad call. I would love to catch a bluefin tuna from the kayak. I did. Just uh, earlier this year, I went to Panama and I was kayak fishing in Panama. And I caught a yellowfin tuna That's from cool. the kayak. It, it was slightly bigger than a false albacore. But I yeah. can still say, if I, if I omit the size of it, I can still say I caught a yellowfin tuna from a kayak. So that was pretty cool. Pretty awesome. Any other good ones on that list, uh, Jimmy? One that I know is very high on yours, and that's the halibut. Mm-hmm. And a muskie in Maine. That's one I really want to check off. Uh, Maine muskie is, uh, they're, they're introduced there. I know some some fishermen that, that prefer, you know, would rather see the native species like brook trout and landlocked salmon thrive, aren't thrilled to see the muskies there, but they seem to be taking hold, and it seems to be a great place to uh, maybe shave a couple 
casts off that 10,000 needed <laughs> to catch your first muskie. I'm at about 30,000 waiting for my first one. I know you have one already. Yeah, but it might as well have been a pike in a muskie suit. <laughs> the thing was uh, average at best, but uh, my good buddy Joe Peachy actually broke 40 inches not long after I boated my first muskie on my first ever muskie trip, which was awesome. But that, that was in Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Doesn't count. I get it. And though I it counts, it. but it's just, it's, it's cooler to get it close to I love to catching home. new species. So, Jim, take us through... Uh, your bucket list. Uh, what do you got? It, it's a long one. Uh, and, and some of them are, are out, not going to happen this year because well, they're too far away. Teaser. Like I, teaser. Let me interrupt here. Yeah. I have three bucket lists. They're, they're oh. segmented in categories. So uh, have at it, buddy. That's, what do you that's got? more organized than you are in any other part of your life. Oh, but, that's yeah. not true. <laughs> uh, so mine, if we're talking 2023, within driving distance of home, muskies probably at the top of that list. Swordfish is is very high on that list. I want to get a swordfish, um, and uh, let let me kick it to you because I have it written down somewhere. I just need to find it. All right. Well, I'll uh, I'll kind of take a stab at how I sorted my bucket list because it <laughs> would go on forever. I mean, it's everything you haven't done yet, right? But uh, in the Northeast, definitely top spot swordfish. Um, we failed heroically on a few different occasions, uh, at trying to check that. But in that process, it's kind of gotten to the point where like, I want to catch a sword this way, which is ridiculous, but, um, I want to catch one at night or catch one on the jig or catch one in a a really cool setting rather than, you know, I I don't think a daytime deep drop swordfish would, would fully check off that box for me. I think it would have it would it check in. the box, but I wouldn't feel as good about doing it the other ways that you can do it. Uh, I, I, just the little kid in me wants mm-hmm. to just be able to poke one in its eye and and feel its you know its bill and and check it out like up close and personal because I've never I've never seen one in person like that. You know, it's like so that's number one for me. Halibut absolutely number two, and I feel like you know you actually have a shot at that uh, the way things have been going. Um, Cobia, right in the three hole. Um, definitely a fish that I, I really want to get to know. Uh, Wahoo's in the mix. And uh, I haven't done a big guy yet. I've lost one at the boat uh, to no fault of my own. Um, Danny Vieira. But uh, anyways, uh, big guy rounds out my kind of northeast top five. And then just general salt. I'll just kind of rattle these ones off real quick. Permit, Rooster, GT, Kabira Snappa, and... Maybe sheephead, um, I think, or black drum in that in that five hole for for the general saltwater species. Um, then you know you got to kick it to fresh water. And number one, I've had one dance with uh, w- with the species, and it it made me you know it made me look like a fool. I hooked a steelhead on my first ever trip to Pulaski, and uh, it uh. It, it owned me and I was on it for what, maybe 40 seconds. We saw it jump next to the other drift boat and I was alerted to be how big it was. And then, uh, it jumped the pool and, and was basically headed for, uh, Canada. <laughs> like, so rather than, uh, <laughs> let it keep going, I tried to stop and pulled the hook. Uh, King salmon's number two, bowfin number three. I'm going to skip four. I'm going to leave that one. Uh, I'm going to leave that one out there for Jim to kind of come back in with uh, his bucket list. And then five is kind of just like a, a smorgasbord of uh, species I have not caught on the freshwater side. Carp, which should be easy to check off. Snakehead, another one if you're in the right spot. Shouldn't be too hard. And then walleye. And believe it or not, Jim, I have not caught a pike. I've had a couple pike follows up in Maine, Belgrade Lakes and stuff when I was like eight which was awesome. Um, just have not got a hook in a pike yet. Carp and walleye, I feel like, are just two that it, it, you just haven't gotten around to No, yet. I've carp fished once in my life with you and in typical Jim and Cheech fashion. We got that was, skunked. That was right after that horrible steelhead trip. <laughs> we, 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 one we, steelhead we, got was skunked, we got skunked steelhead fishing, then we got home. Let's and do was, something we're, easy, Jim. Let's go carp fishing. Let's just go hear our drags. And we sat and froze our asses off and didn't catch any <laughs> tog. Uh, my list is, is is pretty similar to yours. In the Northeast, I want to get a swordfish in the worst way. I'd like to get a cobia. Now, we talked about this in our conversation with Joe, how, you know, there's species you can travel to catch, but catching them in home waters yeah. is a little extra. Definitely. Kind of a little extra. It gives a little zing. You know, I, yeah. I, I want to catch a cobia, but I want to do it in the Northeast. Yeah. I want to get a big sheep's head, but I want to do that in New Such Jersey. Cool fish. You know, an Atlantic halibut. 
Sure. Could go to Norway and, yeah. and have a... No, I want to catch one in our backyard. You know, I'd like to catch one off the coast of Massachusetts. So those are my main ones. I want to catch a Wahoo too, but that's the type of thing where... Like, I'm not going to go out and target them. I here. I'm not going to be on a boat and target them. Anybody want to go Wahoo just, fishing, hit me up. Cheats 232323. Let's go. Um, freshwater, I got to check off muskie. And uh, sturgeon would be a cool one, too. But Ooh. those are all... But in terms of the Northeast ones, those are, are my main ones. I, I like think it. realistically, I've got a shot at uh, checking off Cobia this year. Uh, we talk about Cheap's head with Sermeli a little bit. Yeah, he um, shut down real quick. Oh, yeah. He's got... Uh, he keeps that close to the vest. And a lot of guys do. And they should, because it sounds like those are very specific uh, kind of small just areas when to get pressure. you think you know a guy. You know? <laughs> just when you think you're trusted enough to be brought in on something super quiet. Nope. But one of the main topics of our conversation with Joe's is a fish that's uh, it's on our list, and it's it, it's very high on my list. I want to catch a big blue catfish. And I just had big catfish, period. Yeah. Like, big channel cat, big blue. Yep, I'll take either one. So they're, they grow to big sizes. They're becoming increasingly abundant. Not so much in the northeast, the blue catfish yet, but more the mid-Atlantic area. Uh, they're, they're all over the Potomac. They're getting into the Susquehanna. Yeah. And that's something that I think with just a little bit of a road trip, we could easily check that off, catch a freshwater fish that weighs 30, 40, up to 60 pounds. That's insane. And uh, that's something that I do feel like we're missing in New England yeah. is that big catfish. We've got channel catfish here, white catfish. I meant flat, uh, flathead catfish, not channels. They get bigger, right? Yeah, flatheads get big. Channel catfish get pretty big too, but not, not so much here. Flatheads, you can get those... Uh, in Jersey and Pennsylvania, I had a great trip on the Susquehanna River a couple years ago for them um, around Harrisburg, so central Pennsylvania, where we caught them up to 40 pounds. Uh, but catfish are really cool. Joe has a lot of insights on why it's worth targeting these fish and why it's worth uh, fishing for some of the ones that, that some anglers might turn their nose up at, you know, so the snakehead, like the bow fins, the catfish. I wanted to, I wanted to kind of touch on uh, what ones do you think you actually, you know, if you're a betting man... You kind of plan out your year as we all do. What do you think you're gonna, you know, accomplish off the list? What, what do you, what do you think you're gonna check off this year if you were a betting man? I think cobia. I think I could get cobia done this year. Nice. I think if I if I uh, ask nicely, maybe some people who are on them in uh, New Jersey or New York uh, might let me tag along with them. That would be. Uh, I think that would be the one. I'm. I want to try the most to check that one off. Uh, swordfish, I'd love to, but you know, canyon. I, I don't get to the canyons every year. Yeah. On a good year, uh, although we are scheduled for uh, to go on the Helen H again this September. We had a great trip with him with uh, oh, Captain Joe Huckemeyer on that one. And yeah, Anthony hooked great. one. You can actually see that whole thing play out on uh, one of the more recent episodes of At the Rail. We can put the link in the uh, show notes here. But yeah, swordfish would be great. I feel like Kobe is more realistic if it happens to the yeah. extent that it happened last year where guys were, they were reliably going out and seeing them hanging around the bunker schools you we, know, in, in the late summer. Yeah, we talked about doing a FIP strip this year as well, um, which kind of puts halibut in uh, in the crosshairs. So it would be nice to, to, you know, one of us to check that off if we do make that trip. Swordfish, I think one of us is destined to, to check that one off. I'm with you on the Cobia, buddy. And I think halibut is, Fipney's Ledge is, uh, you know, it's a distant structure. It doesn't get hit or commercially fished very hard, but party boats go out there and uh, it's probably one of the best places to have a shot at an, at an Atlantic halibut here um, in New England. But if we go out there with a party boat full of guys, you know, we have a one in 40 shot of that being us. It would be cool to see one. Yeah. But I, I get the feeling we'll go out there. We'll waste the entire trip fishing giant halibut jigs and, and pass <laughs> up all our shots at getting good Pollock and then still come home disappointed when some dude gets one on a tiny piece of clam and a high Yeah, low or rig. a Norwegian jig and they're jigging for Pollock or something. But, you know, I've been told that if you target them specifically, you're basically agreeing to go giant tuna fishing but for bottom fish and you know if you're patient and you stick with it you'll get the bite these days like that's you know if you're dedicated enough to the cause the chances of going out and uh and getting that bite if you specifically only target that and you're willing to to skip out on the drop and reel you know pollock and and you know other ground fish fishing that you know you're you up your odds significantly and also going with a captain like uh jim walsh yeah who exactly has been dialing that in as uh, since he got the American Classic back in the water. He's been uh, on that halibut uh -huh. hunt. 
Um, for me, I think uh, Steelhead hopefully falls soon. I think that's, you know, outside of the, the you know, lower tiered ones like Carp, which, you know, we could probably get done in the next few weeks if we get the weather. Uh, Jim and I have a Steelhead trip, uh, you know. That's not going we're going to we're, we're gonna try to check that one off for old we Chi-Chi. Could, we could describe this one. We don't need one. to describe it. It's just happening. It's planned. So if we if we blank on that one. I'm not going to be a happy camper. We'll do a we'll do a steelhead trip recap <laughs> for a future introduction to the podcast and talk about how this this attempted mix it like bring our wives out there on a steelhead trip and entertaining them while also fishing uh, yeah, it's gonna, for hearts it's content fail miserably. This is going to be a uh, nobody's going to be happy. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, enjoy this podcast. This uh, conversation with Joe Cermelli. and uh, check us out every other Monday. A new episode of the On the Water podcast. Thanks for joining, guys. If you've been listening to the On The Water podcast, do us a favor. Leave us a rating and a review, a comment. Let us know what you think, uh, what you'd like to see on future episodes, even guests. And tell a friend. Spread the word. You know, we appreciate you guys listening, and thanks for tuning in. Today's episode of the On The Water podcast is brought to you by Old Town Canoe and Kayaks. Old Town has been making the finest canoes and kayaks for over 120 years, right on the banks of the Penobscot River in Maine. Their line of sportsman fishing kayaks has options for every angler, fresh and salt, inshore and offshore, and they come in paddle, pedal, and power versions. I'm a huge fan of saltwater kayak fishing, and I absolutely love my Old Town Sportsman Big Water 132 pedal kayak. It's big enough to take offshore and out into open water, but it's nimble enough for fishing inshore in the backwaters. Plus, it's super stable. I am totally comfortable standing up in my kayak, fly fishing for striped bass. I also use it to bottom fish for black sea bass and to tog. In the fall, I take it out on the water almost every day to chase false albacore. Absolutely my favorite fish to chase from the kayak. So if you're looking to get into kayak fishing or if you're maybe already a kayak fishing addict and you're just looking to upgrade, I highly recommend checking out the Old Town Sportsman line of kayaks. You can take a look online at oldtowncanoe.com slash on the water. Once again, that's oldtowncanoe.com slash on the water. Check them out. Hey, welcome to another episode of the On the Water podcast. Uh, clearly, this is a bit of an away game for us. We are down here with Joe Cermelli of the Cut and Retie podcast. And uh, Joe's been kind enough to let us record in his studio. As you can tell, it uh, it looks a little nicer than ours. We have a mount in our studio, Joe. <laughs> we have, uh, we've got a replica of the world record striped bass. But it is hovering right over our guests. Like, it looms over ah, them. Yeah. So whenever they emote and they, they lean back, the pectoral fin is is hanging on by a thread. We have we have destroyed the mount. It, it pretty soon will be right up here next to your Palomino trout. Well, I'll take it. This is where all uh, old skin mounts go to die. So, you know. <laughs> so Joe's been a, a man, one of my best friends in the fishing industry for the past, man, 12, 10 years? Well, it's been least. a long time. And I, dude, I'm so I'm so happy that we're here together doing this, right? So if anybody we recorded a cut and retie with you guys before we were doing the on the water here in, in the, the cut and retie bunker. So hopefully some people have already listened to that. This is the follow up. So yeah, I did want to mention it is it's the bunker, but I, I have to call it the bunker because I'm very sensitive about my Philadelphia accent being up there in Massachusetts where they oh, cut the R's you're off sensitive of about everything. That, John? I'll call yeah. it the bunker. <laughs> I, no, I know I know I'm worried my kids already sound like him. Him. They, they look like him a little well, bit too. Well, that's such a, a tremendous bit. accent. I, I meant to bring that up when we were, when we were recording earlier. Yeah, I just, God, I love your accent. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. So, Joe, <laughs> I, long before we ever fished uh, together, before you knew who I was, I knew you from New Jersey Angler. Yeah. From Saltwater Sportsman. I, I'm, I'm going to do a quick walk you through your- New Jersey Angler? That's where I started with New Jersey Angler Magazine. Yes, wow. sir. I'll mm-hmm. do a quick walk through your career. New Jersey Angler, Saltwater Sportsman, Field and Stream, Outdoor Life, and meat eater, and mm-hmm. now cut and retie. You've gone out on your own, taking all this, what, fifteen years of, of fishing I, media experience? Yeah, I've struck it out. I've struck it out on my own. Um, I could barely afford the Santa hats on all the little fish over there, uh, <laughs> so it's going well. But yeah, man, after uh, after seventeen years or so of, of of working for bigger media corporations, I decided to uh, cut and retie, if you will, <laughs> and uh, start my own thing. So I started my own little media company, and it started with this with this podcast. Good deal, man. And you are, you're very much a New Jersey guy. You grew up fishing a lot of the same waters I did. Uh, I yeah. think I was a little bit further south than you. I, I grew up in Philadelphia fishing Ocean City, Longport. Now, I know you're, you're fishing that area now, but you were you Atlantic City North mostly? 
Yeah, it's funny. So my uh, my dad and I had a boat in Atlantic City in, in the State Marina, Farley State Marina, right next to the old Trump Castle from first grade through senior year of high school. And we spent every weekend on that boat. It was a it was a 28-foot Penyon cabin, cabin cruiser, and that was our shore house. So like my early saltwater fishing uh, was all in Atlantic City. And <laughs> there was a tunnel drive boat, so it ran like two miles an hour full full open. <laughs> and like it shot out a rooster tail longer than the boat. So my dad actually hated taking it out because it also didn't turn well. So like coming back into the dock was a real challenge. You know, like it was like all hands on deck to help to, <laughs> to help the little Joe was the name of the boat come in. And uh, but you know, spending so many years down there, um, I was running around since I was, you know, in, in first grade on the fuel dock at night in the lights for weak fish and underneath the brigantine bridge and i would sit at the end of that dock so um later in life i kind of gravitated north i had my own boat in barnegat inlet and now i spend a lot of time sort of mm, seaside north really but uh yeah dude as a little kid it was like atlantic city was where i cut my teeth saltwater fishing in jersey and now like you said my in-laws have a place in ocean city where you have family family house and uh, we have a boat down there, so yeah, I've you know I've been all over, but I would say that Central Jersey LBI to Sandy Hook is really where I play around the most these days. And growing up as kind of like a little pier rat down in uh, in, I feel like Jersey is kind of the northernmost limit of the pier rat lifestyle. Like you have a lot of that in the Outer Banks in Florida, but do you see that's interesting to me because I uh, like I know there's a lot of historic piers in New Jersey. You have a lot of these towns like the Ventnor Fishing Pier, the Ocean City Fishing Pier, and there are these historic things and I've looked them up online and it's like how do you get membership and all this stuff and I, I know they date yeah, way back. The Ocean City Fishing Club is like since 1913 Cr- and it's big money to join. But you know what, dude? All these piers, these fishing clubs, I don't ever see anybody fishing on the piers. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you the problem with the Ocean City Fishing Club one is that the, uh, I, I think the end of the pier is over about three feet of water. Right, <laughs> that that is what, that is a problem. It's just <laughs> I, I'm I'm so intrigued by pier culture. We have a mutual friend Zach Miller from Florida. He grew up doing this piers, bridges. That's his thing. And there's such a deep rooted culture in the South for pier fishing and along the Gulf. So it's always intrigued me. Like I sort of want to know more. Obviously, at some point in history, pier fishing in in Jersey was a big deal. These piers are still standing and they're so historic. I don't ever see anybody fishing on them though. You know? No, I, and I, I blame the beach replenishment. I, the beach replenishment gets blamed for everything bad that happened to the shore fishing yeah. in New Jersey. Yeah. But I think that's why so many of these piers are sanded in. New Jer- uh, Ocean City used to have two. It has the one that's still at 13th Street. Right. And then it used to have one at 59th Street, which has been destroyed over time. With There's no evidence of it anymore. Right. But that was another big one. And you can look through the archives of the Ocean City Fishing Club catches going back to 1913 and you see red drum on there uh, uh yeah striped bass bluefish so clearly like that was a getting your bait out yeah. further on those piers caught those guys a lot of extra fish back then sure and i was it's funny you bring up the redfish i was going to say we've known each other a long time and when i still worked for field and stream you know we had access to the archives so right there in my office i, I worked in manhattan i commuted to to our offices in manhattan and you had the entire paper archive there going back to 18 18- whatever when field and stream started is woods and water and at one point i did this experiment where i flipped through like every issue from 1900 on to see how many articles i could find about new jersey surf fishing and from i i I don't know if this is exact but i want to say from like 1900 to 1952 you could not find a new jersey surf fishing article in field and stream that was tied to striped bass it was all redfish we were a red state and i remember photocopying all of these articles, and I sent like a packet to you. I'm like, I, I still the, have it. Van yeah. Campen Hel- Van Campen Hellner was yeah. the author of a lot of those stories. Yeah, and it's a it's a it's a weird deal because it seemed to me like looking at those archives and sort of matching things up. If you wanted to catch stripers back in those days, in the early 1900s especially, it was all Sandy Hook North, Long Island, up to Cape Cod, where you are now. But uh, all these places I grew up, Manasquan Inlet, Barnegat Inlet, especially. Dude, we were a red state, and not like puppy draw, man, like giant ass bulls, right? Channel bass. Channel they bass them. is what they call them. And I remember one in particular, uh, Wreck Island, I believe it's called. There's an island between Long Beach Island and Brigantine that is still uninhabited, right? To, now, but I think it's a bird sanctuary or something now. You're not supposed to walk around out there. But I found there's an article in that packet about guys going out there to explore it to see about setting up a pay fish camp on Wreck Island. And it's like, let's go out here and see how the fishing is. 
to this day, dude, I'd love to go surf fish Wreck Island. You're not allowed to do it, but it's this this little stretch of completely uninhabited oceanfront island in Jersey. And that's where so many of those those redfish were caught back in the day. So the author of a lot of those stories, Van Kemp and Helner, was kind of a, he was like a rich Manhattanite. Yes. Who would come down on his yacht or whatever the version, 1913 version of the yacht was. Schooner. And he had like a cook with it's him. It's not a schooner, it's a sailboat. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> it's for anybody who's a Mall Rats fan, you'll get that joke. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> So he would come down and he had like a cook to prepare his meals and they would just go out and they'd surf fish all yeah. day because I bought a book that also had a collection of his articles called The Call of the Surf. Uh-huh. And uh, that has a lot of the Grey Gull Shoals, which is one of the articles you sent me. Yeah. You, you said where, and I remember you wrote the note, where do you think Grey Gull Shoals is? Yeah. My guess is somewhere around, around Little Egg uh, I, I, or, or Great Egg Inlet. But. I would think so. But, you know, it's, uh, and I, I don't, I don't want, I don't want to steer the, but the conversation, but I just, I, I look at those things and nowadays, as you know, you can catch yourself a redfish in Jersey. It's hard to target them, right? But they're around. And they, I mean, there are certain places where people claim they can. But point being, like, you, you look at that and you look at stripers now, sort of how Delaware Bay is getting a little quieter than it was in the early 2000s and things are shifting. You know, it makes you wonder, like, what, what's, is, is there something cyclical here, you know? Because red, redfish aren't overfished. Uh, you don't hear... right. People in North Carolina complaining about the lack of them and Florida complaining about the lack of them. Redfish numbers are fine. Like they, they seem to be pretty well regulated yes. and uh, guys enjoy great fisheries for them, but they haven't returned to New Jersey. And I, I think it has to be habitat. Um, a captain we fished with, uh, Captain Brian Williams out of Ocean City, New Jersey. Bad fish. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's a great captain, light tackle and fly guy. And he talked, he's, he's also got a great history of the area. He wrote a story for, for On the Water on... Um, Iron Haven was what the Dutch settlers, who were the first people to come to southern New Jersey, called it for Egg Harbor. Is yeah. What it then became because of all the shorebirds. Sorry, I knocked the table. Because of all the nesting shorebirds in the area. Um, but he said that there used to be eelgrass out all those inlets. Corson's uh -huh. Inlet, uh -huh. Red Egg Harbor Inlet. And then as the septic tanks went in and the houses went in, right. killed off the eelgrass, killed off the, the prime red drum habitat. So that's why they haven't fully come back but i'm hopeful like you that it's, it's something that's cyclical because i've caught red drum in florida i've caught him in north carolina yeah i want a jersey red. i've caught him in a lot of places and I, and I feel the same way although maybe i'm being pessimistic i mean I, do i think you or i are going to see like raging bulls here i don't uh, i mean there's there's smaller ones around i too would love to catch one and i know people who can probably make it happen it's just a matter of finding the time to go do it but it would be even if it was small drum it would be neat to be able to go out and, and do that as a thing versus stumbling into them or having to be in this one particular area. Because I, I agree with you on the habitat. Things certainly change. At the same time, I spent a lot of time in South Jersey behind Wildwood and Cape May, um, you know, fishing for, for stripers in, this, in the sod banks down there. And man, there are some scenarios down there I've been in where you're in a foot of water, you are watching stripers wake out from every direction and if you if you blocked out the Garden State Parkway to your west, it it, it 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 could be South Carolina. It looks exactly like places I've been in Georgetown and and Charleston. Um, and every single time I do that, I think that one of those hits is going to end up being a red because probably in, in a broader sense, you're right. There's not enough habitat here to facilitate this this you know bolster this 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 population. But man, people are always shocked when I say like, well, we have so much stuff that's so redfishy, you know, like it's, it's every bit of South Carolina. That's a good point. Like I'm, I'm not from around here. When I come down here, there is a the lot, accent. there is a lot that, re that, that <laughs> reminds me of uh, the low country. Yeah. Yeah. It de definitely looks redfishy for sure. And if you look at, let's say the northernmost part of big red fish in the surf, I, I would have to say is Assateague Island. Mm-hmm. And as the crow flies, that's only about 70 or 80 miles. Yeah. So the habitat, I mean, the water temperature is not that different. Nope. It, it's got to be something about the habitat. I think it is. Not, I think you know. it is because I don't think we're too far off from being able to target Cobia in, in New Jersey, Long Island, maybe off the Block Island area. Like, I think that's like right around the corner for us, which is awesome, right? But redfish seems a lot further away. And, and knowing the issues that take place down in Florida, that's way far away from us with eelgrass habitat, 
you know, degrading to almost being non-existent, that there has to be something to be said about that. Yeah, I, I want to talk about Cobia too, but, but Joe, I know you are like a big, you're a big hometown guy. Like yeah. you, you, you have a New Jersey and New Jersey fish tattooed on your calf. I do. And I know to you, like what catching species? those, even though just full disclosure, because I don't like to, I don't like to scam people. The bunker here is actually in Bucks County, PA, <laughs> but like we could spit on Jersey. It's like you could step outside and see Jersey. Like I can smell it when the wind's from the east. <laughs> I'm only here because of the tax break, but I am a Jersey <laughs> guy through and through. I only jumped the river for the tax break. Okay. <laughs> But I, I know catching those fish, those southern fish in your home waters, like that's something I always – like you, you can travel to catch a redfish. I really want a Jersey one. I want a Jersey Kobe. Sure. I want a Jersey sheep's head. Sure. I know you've checked the Jersey sheep's head box. I, I feel that way about a lot of things, including snakeheads. Like, you know, I, I'm enamored with snakehead fishing. It's cool to go to Virginia and Maryland and do that, but they've been there for a long time. There's something that tickles me a little more about catching one down the street. I am smitten with Jersey sheep's head. Although be careful what you ask me because uh, you have oh. so Jim has so many burning questions about my, my Jersey sheep's head. Uh, we actually got a uh, scoop on that. You got nothing. We you got think a scoop you got on something. that. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I'm, I, I'm not divulging that publicly because I, I respect you, Joe. It's don't, You don't have to respect me. I respect the man that let me in. Well, I wouldn't do him dirty like that. I'm not doing him dirty like that. He's probably going to listen to this, and I will not. But Jim, I once sent Jim a very vague video. Like, you could see nothing, but he heard church bells. And I got a text back where he is just, like, my, every church in, in, in 50 miles of where I could have been is marked. And I'm like, well, start calling, idiot, and asking him to please record their bells until you figure it out. I, yeah, I, that's so. I, I know no bounds when it comes I, to I, finding I, I the, the fishing don't. spot I want to find. But I know. Uh, yeah, those southern species in New Jersey. I know. Have you caught a Jersey cobia yet? No, and you're gonna. Jim's gonna slap me. Uh, I I uh, I I have some contacts to do that too, and it's been a like, hey man, come on down, and I'm like, I can't today. I've blown it. I the opportunity was there. Although I have, I've heard this past summer was not as strong as it has been in the past. To your point, Cheech, I think I think like sheep's head, cobia has elevated to a very targetable New Jersey fish. Yeah. It has jumped from because even I ran a boat for twelve years out of Barnegat Inlet, right? Um, I caught one, and that was like you did you would, catch it fluking? No, I caught it sight fishing. Wow, but that That's was in, in twelve years. One time I bumped into it was two fish, and we used to run out to one of the separation buoys to look for mahi. And I got out there one day, and I'm like, what the heck are those? And it was two <laughs> cobes, and we got one to eat. We got the smaller one to eat, and then the bigger one disappeared. But it was always this like, oh, hey, did you hear so-and-so trolled one on a green machine in the canyon? Oh, I remember that week? episode of New Jersey yeah, Angler. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, New Jersey Angler. Those guys, um, Darren Doris and Bill Donovan, they had been picking cobia here and there for years. But now I think, and again, I'm not going to divulge the pattern. I've, I've, I've not done it, but I've, I've talked a lot about uh, it is it is becoming a more and more targetable thing year over year. So there's some science to that behind that backing it. We ran a story a couple years ago on cobia habitat mm -hmm. and just estimating as ocean conditions change. They said in, in 40 years, 35 percent of the best habitat for cobia in the summertime is going to be New Jersey. Really? Mm-hmm. 10% of that's going to be Long Island, and I think another 5% is Rhode Island, or Connecticut. Well, won't like Rhode half Island. the state also be underwater by their estimations, too, by that? Probably, yeah. It'll, <laughs> you got to pick and choose. You got to pick and choose with those estimates. <laughs> Good Cobia, coastal living, not so much. Yeah. But this year was a big year for Cobia at the northern end of the state. They seem to see a lot around the bunker schools uh, up off Long Island and um, you know, Sandy now, Hook see, area. That's not so. even something I was aware of, because the guys I know who do it are, are further south. I didn't really even know they straggled that far north with any sort of consistency. Um, but dude, I, I have always been intrigued. I love, I love Southern visitors, right? I do. And I've just always been intrigued by the, how this used to be a red state. Now the Kobe are here. If you look at maps of Barnegat Bay, there's a Creek there. It's called Tarpon Gut. It's called Tarpon Gut for a reason, because historically we would, we would get a little bit of straggler tarpon. The, the, the kid that spearfished one in Barnegat Inlet. I right? remember that. Very right. unpopular kid. Very unpopular. <laughs> not I, not the best move, whatever. But look, say what you want about him. You love what he did. You hate what he did. It doesn't matter. They were there, and he wasn't the only one. So, um, yeah, I, like to me, in that scenario, if I went diving or, or saw tarpon, 
I would have gone the hero route first of trying to catch one on a rod and reel before spearing one, but be that as it may, they were there. And I remember as a kid, going back to those Atlantic City days, every once in a while in the late summer, you'd hear somebody hooking a tarpon at Brigantine Beach. You know what I mean? Um I think I think it's just the nature of anglers to be intrigued by the, the the possibility of these oddballs from time to time. It's just interesting when, like sheep's head, as an example, there were probably some sheep's head here in the '90s. Probably not that many, but there were probably some. Or you know, around these bridges and wherever you, it is you find them, and now that's developed into something that is that is very targetable. And I think I mean, you look at sheep's head bay in Brooklyn. Yeah, it's and- called that for a reason too. Exactly. Yeah. And I think those sheep said, uh, like you said, they were probably around. People put, did, might not have had a handle on targeting them right. at that point. And uh, I was surprised to learn, uh, you know, I talked to somebody in South Jersey, a captain down there. He said, they move in with the drum. Like, they're here in May. Huh. And he said, because I always thought, like, well, they're southern fish. They must be here in July and August when it's the hottest. Yeah. And now, he see, said, I, I've heard so many weird things about them. Like, uh, at this point, you know, central and south Jersey, the, the sheep's head thing is getting more and more established all the time. But then you you talk to now this is secondhand information friends of mine who have friends who spear fish in North Jersey. I've heard oh there's sheep's head on all the bridges up here, but nobody seems to be able to be, to get one on a, on a hook there. Now why is that? You know what I mean? So it's one of those weird things that I think there's more of them out there than you than you even realize. It's just taking so much more time for people to figure them out, you know? So I, I didn't know we were going to go down the southern species in New Jersey route, but I'm glad we did. I'm but, just following your lead, Jim. No, you well, started with redfish. I'm a terrible host of this. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where I'm going to go. I just kind of start throwing things out. But I did want to talk to you about what most people think of as a southern species. And it's one that I know that you really like. It's not she, uh, snakeheads. It's catfish. I know you've done a lot of traveling for catfish. You and I had a pretty Love incredible catfishing. catfish trip. And that's something that in the northeast... We don't have much catfish. We we have them, but, but they're, they're not, not very popular. And and you you have a fishery right close to home, uh-huh. and just within a man a day trip's drive, you can catch some very large catfish. And how'd you get started on the whole catfish thing? Like what what it, turned you on to that? It's it's a weird deal, right? And, and I think you and I share this as much of a love as we have for figuring out technical things with lures and flies. I just love soaking a giant piece of cut bait and waiting for a rod to fold the frick in half, right? So I I love catfishing. I love catfishing. I love bowfin fishing for the same reason. And everybody wants them on the frog. That's cool. I don't mind soaking a chunk of shad and letting the bowfin bend a rod in half in a holder. Um, I got started with catfish just out of necessity back in the hook shots days when I was still filming that for Field and Stream. Eventually, it came to a point where it's like, we have to do a catfish show. A lot of people love catfishing. Let's do it. And I got hooked up with some boys on the James River in Virginia. And I'll admit, I sort of went into it sort of la-di-da. Like, oh, okay, I'll, I'll try this, whatever. Yeah. Dude, like big blue cats rip. And when you, I think the biggest thing about catfishing is it has this this sort of stigma as lazy man's fishing. Like, hey, you get a chunk of bait and you get yourself a lawn chair and you, you don't have to think. But when you're with a good cat guy and you you look at how many spots he has marked and he's going to soak for 10 minutes here and that's it because he knows if he doesn't get bit then it's time to go here. And you really see what goes into it, what goes into getting fresh bait and how these guys rig and how they cast out an eight rod spread. It is way more technical than you think it would be. And I appreciated that. And uh, the first time I ever did it, we had fish to 50 pounds and I fell in love with it. And now, unfortunately, I don't have that right down the street. We're right down the street from the Delaware River, though, as you know, because the Delaware is like the last major undammed river on the East Coast. We have things nobody else has. Our American shad run trumps all American shad runs, herring, stripers, all kinds of things. Um and it's sort of a blessing and a curse. We don't have blue cats. We do have some flatheads, and that population is growing. I haven't figured that out yet. That's neither here nor there. We have some of, I'm, I'm convinced, the biggest channel cats. Like, if, if you're okay with channel, I've caught channel cats at 15 pounds easily right down the street from here. And to your point about catfishing in the Northeast being not so popular, very few people are out here messing with channel cats. And it's wide open. And even if I'm not fishing for them, you just float this river on a clear day. You're like, oh, 10-pound channel, oh, 12 pounds, just blowing out from under the boat. So I, I've gotten very into that, and I've, I've spent time in Philly 
flathead fishing the Schuylkill, which is good. But then, of course, the the single most badass catfish experience of my life was with you, Jim, on the Susquehanna. Uh, this got to be, what, five years ago at this point, something like that, right around Halloween. And uh, we couldn't keep five lines in the water for more than 30 seconds without a 20-plus pound to 40-pound flathead mowing the shit down. But before that, before that, we spent four or five hours with the captain telling us, the guide saying, I know right where I can go and I can fill this boat with 30-pound catfish. And we were like, why aren't we there right now? After 30 minutes, you're like, okay, okay, I I bet you do. We must be heading there. Four hours later, I'm like, then let's go to that place. Yeah. We got there and sure as shit, man, he sets the rods out. I don't think he set all of them out. And uh, all of a sudden the rod starts going down and he was very particular about who, uh, who took the rods. You talk about guys having their system in place. How deep do you want to get into that trip, Jim? I, I want to hear about this. Because I've got a couple of, of craft cocktails in me, and I could go on that one. I want to hear let's, about let's this. Let's go a little deeper than surface level. Okay, a little deeper. All right, so I, I will... I will. I mean, you can see the whole thing on Hook Shots. Yes, the Hook Shots it's, oh, video it's still, is still out, out on out there. YouTube. Yeah, look up Susquehanna Catfish uh, uh, Hook Shots, and you'll see Jim and I... Um, I'm not going to say the I'm not going to say the guy's name. I'm not going to say the guy's name, okay? But he was recommended to me, and... Um, Let's just say, I don't think I've ever met a captain who lived, slept, ate, and breathed his target species more than this gentleman. I would call him a tortured genius of a catfishing. A tortured <laughs> genius of catfish. And um, he got it done. I mean, he, he got it done. He was wired. But to, I, I think I can sort of sum it up with one, one happening. And you got to remember, you know, flatheads, they don't chew great during the day. So it's its mostly nighttime thing. So we're out there, you know, we're starting at 6 p.m. in October and going until first light. So we're out there all night. And, you know, I'm a personable guy. Jim's a personable guy. You're, you're spending all night on a boat chunking with somebody. You, you, you just want to make small to talk. Them. You want to make small yeah. talk. And I, you know, I'm just, just intrigued by my surroundings in general. I have questions. I'm in a new area. So we're out there at, at one spot. Before we got to the spot that, like, to, to Jim's point, basically what I think it was was he knew this was a wintering hole. And he was actually, I think, trying to avoid us filming there because it was so good. So he was hoping we could get it done elsewhere. But, like, if all else fails and these spots are not working, then I'll take these guys to the money. So we ended up having to go to the money. But before we got to the money, we were flim-flamming back and forth between all these other spots and picking these little fish. So, you know, there's this uh, this train line that runs along the Susquehanna. And at one point, this train, it's, it's midnight or something, this train's coming. And I was just like, man, I'm always so intrigued by these late-night trains. Where, what, do you, what do you think that, that train is hauling there, guy? Like, where is that going? And most guys would be like, well, you know, they run coal from here to Binghamton. And most and guides know the area most well. Most guys and they will know give you like, the area. And this you guy. You got a natural history looks, lesson, he, a history he, lesson. He, like, yeah. He looks me right in the face and goes, I don't know. All I know is that has absolutely nothing to do with flathead catfish. And I was like, <laughs> shit. <laughs> All right. <laughs> we looked at each other. That we're like, dude well, is focused. Buckle up. <laughs> I, I want to make it very clear that I'm not being judgmental. I'm just giving facts. There was like this little social awkwardness, slight Asperger thing with this dude. Like he was super focused on catfish and really knew he lived for catfish. But nothing like it was. He had he had he had rods numbered. He had rods numbered. This is rod one in position one. This is rod two in position two, four, and like one one A, two A. Yes. So I was (laughs) I was the one A side of the boat. I was one A, one B, one C. You were two A, two B, two C. Yeah. So we had six. I I think we had six. Maybe we had eight. Maybe it went up to D. But I was to stay on the on the side one of the boat, and, and you were to stay on side playing. two. He wasn't playing because at one point the bite went crazy, and like this rod's down, and like we're just trying to have a good time and film a show. And he's like, "You are not in one A. I need you to move to one A immediately. That is not one A. That is one B." Like freaking out. The That's first three bites when awesome. we got to the spot came on my side of the boat, and that was great for me. But we're trying to film an episode of Hook Shots, and yeah. and. The, First, if we were fishing normally, it'd be like, okay, I took the first one. You take the second one. Could you I'll imagine if a certain one. someone was there? Stop. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we would alternate. That, I that's know how. who you mean. <laughs>
<laughs> we would alternate. That's what you do when you're fishing. Yeah. Like it's you know the you're first trying to round showcase gets, everybody catching a fish. Even if we were just fishing for fun, it would alternate. You know, if, no, if you're not yeah. holding the rods, you're just chunking. So the fourth one goes off, and I'm like, Joe, you got to take this one. And he shouted, he goes, sit down, you're on 2A, 2B, 2C, 2D. Oh, it was, it was crazy, dude. <laughs> and I remember you go, all right, I messed up. Yeah. <laughs> I got to stay with 2A. Yeah. And then, like, there I am, uncomfortably fighting my fourth catfish yeah. in a row. And that's the point where I almost stopped having fun. I'm like, okay. It ended up not mattering because we caught so many that it all panned out. But, I mean, this dude, he was, like, he was, he was a little, he was slightly off. He was, he was just, like... I he was, was, he was, he was very dialed focused. in on he, he was into the, but it's beyond dialed in, dude. It's yeah, like no, I know what you mean. Dialed in and and and, and neurotic and, is two different things. You know, I, I I part of my whole shtick with cut and retie and everything I've ever done is like let's not take fishing so seriously. It's fishing. This guy was to the extreme, yeah, to the point where it's like. I almost felt like he didn't want us to talk because then we weren't paying enough attention to our 1C, 1A, 2B, whatever. It was a quiet boat in the midst of some incredible fishing. Yeah, it really it really was. I also remember at one point... That like, always works against the experience. Somebody brought up something about headlamps, and he's like, I wear a headlamp almost 24-7. I wear a headlamp when I'm at home just making breakfast and watching TV. You never know when you need a little extra light. And I'm like... Oh, damn. He painted this picture of himself in a dark house with a headlamp on at all times, not yes. using any of his lights. <laughs> hey. I, I said sir, I said a little deeper than surface level. We're getting a little too deep. <laughs> I um, know. But what we, we can get out of it, because I, I can sense Jim wants to move on. The flatheads <laughs> were up to 39 pounds, oh, though. I mean, they were had enormous fish. That, yeah, they, yeah. Like, I've never heard about catfishing that sounds like cool and, like fun like that sounds fun it's amazing and for the record i will say having spent time with blues channels and flatheads flatheads fight the nastiest really i mean they are the meanest nastiest of all yeah I, but I, I think all all catfish fight pretty well they do uh, I, I i grew up fishing uh baller's pond do you ever hear of baller's pond no it was a pay lake in southern new jersey where you would pay pay lake yeah it, it was the only one they stocked hybrid stripers that one might be from Baller's Pond, that one right there, because <laughs> they did. They would stock them up to 10, 12 pounds, and it was just this little pit, mm -hmm. and you would pay, I think for a kid, you would pay $5, you'd go there, and he would put enormous catfish, and that's where I first really got introduced to yeah. catfish. You would fish to the chicken livers, and I, would, I remember one of the first big catfish I caught, I had the little bells on top of my rod, and the fish hit. I was across the pond. I just see, hear the bells, see it going, and just saw the bells go flying off in one direction, <laughs> and my rod tips just buried down. Cats fight hard. Cats cats fight very hard, and what I've I've really gotten into, you know, it's almost like I feel a little stupid because I grew up on the Delaware and spent very little time caring about channel cats. And what happened was COVID happened, right? And they dropped that rule where it's like, if somebody doesn't live in your house, they shouldn't even be on a boat with you. Now, what you could disagree, or but as, as a media person, I had to follow the rules, right? Whether I wanted to or not, or whether I agreed with that or not, you know, I was working for Mediator at the time, and it was sort of an edict, which I understood. It's like, if we're going to preach to people to chill out so that we can get back to normalcy here, you got to follow the rules, too. So I did, and I don't have anybody else in my household who can jump on the boat with me. <laughs> and now you got, and Jim remembers this, you got two kids who are not in school that you got to worry about, and you're trying to do your job. So time away was very precious. <laughs> so my wife, God bless her, would still, despite all that, despite having basically no break from our kids, it was the middle of shad season. So I would go out and float and shad fish. And I just didn't want to go home. I'm like, I just don't want to go home. Like, I'm out here. I got the time. Like, God, I just I don't want to go home. So I was like, well, what else can we do here? So I would start keeping a few shad and chunking them up. And then little by little, I started dialing in. It's it's good year round, but spring when the shad are in here, that's when you catch the big channels, right? And I got really into it to the point where the following Christmas, I had my wife buy me two St. Croix Mojo Cat outfits that are always with me now. And I, I still enjoy it very much myself, but my son, who's four, man, dude, we spend a lot of time channel cat fishing. If you think about it, for a little kid, that a five, eight perfect. pound channel cat, that's his tuna. That sounds perfect. So I'll go out there with like the junkiest junk rod from the garage to the point where I'm like, if that, if that goes overboard, I don't care. Like I'm not going to lose an ounce of sleep and I will just let him reef on him. So, you know, there's a little Jamie's out there and I'm like, follow your fish. And he's like following the channel cat around the drift boat. I'm like, if he goes that way, you go that way. 
And like that's a super big fish, for, and we have a blast. And there's so many of them out there that it's it's easy. Now I use hot dogs from a jam. <laughs> I, I use hot dogs marinated in cherry Kool Aid and garlic powder. I saw the how to all making yes. them. Yes, yeah. yes. There's nothing better than than doing that that kind of jam with your kids. Yeah, it's yeah. The it's best. super easy because yep. keep it simple. In, in the spring and early summer, in particular, it's it's kind of hard to miss. You might not catch a ton, but you're going to get some bites. And they lose their mind over it. Yeah, and, I mean, like I have so much video, uh, you know, of, of my my kids. Just like he's like, I can't. I'm, I'm like, you must. You will finish this. You know what I mean? Like, but I, you know, it's it's just the juxtaposition of like you know you got a you got an eight seven eight pound channel cat. You know, who cares for a four-year-old, dude, his shit's pinned to the rail. His his, his pinned to the drip boat, and he's like sweating. He's like, wet the reel, daddy, wet the reel. I'm like, you don't have to wet the reel. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Oh, oh, I remember those weeks, though, of, of COVID. And you and I talked fairly frequently then. Like We, we were, commiserated like, like, often. We would check in. <laughs> yeah. And I... To this day, one of the worst fights in my marriage was from that time. You were discovering your catfish. I was coming home from fishing the local pond, and somebody was throwing out a bunch of striper lures. Uh huh. And this is the point you're you're like, oh, you were garbage picking. I was garbage picking, <laughs> and like this is the point where like Pam is is uh, food shopping in like an astronaut suit, right. <laughs> <laughs> and I come home with someone else's trash, but I got away with it. If I hadn't posted it to Instagram, I was like, look at this great garbage find. And, yes. and she comes out and she goes, throw those out of the house. I can't believe you're, you're, you're going through people's garbage in the middle of this pandemic. Yeah. I, you're contaminating sorry. Sorry, yeah. the homestead. So along the lines of those kind of fun bait and weight type fisheries, the other one that I know Anthony's done a lot of is shark fishing. Both big, you know, brown shark fishing and the big real deal shark fishing. And Joe, I know that was always the brown shark. I, thing was I love the big real deal shark. I haven't done it in so long. I miss it. I I do too. And I, I well, I could tell you my history of it in about 30 seconds. But um, caught some threshers, caught tons of browns offshore, used to love it. I've been on the boat when Makos have been caught. I've never reeled in a keeper Mako myself. I had one shot on my old boat 12 miles offshore. And we blew it at the gaff. And even though I agree that these fish are in trouble and these new regulations are a good thing, we needed to do that. I just wanted my one. <laughs> I just wanted my one. And unfortunately, I never got it. I assume you have because you grew yeah. up doing a lot of offshore fishing. Yeah. Plenty of Makos. My, my kind of white whale was a, a thresher that was borderline state record class quality. And it, it owned me. Yeah. To the point where it still haunts me. Yeah. I had a guy that never had um, shark fish that screamed orca because it's it was beating up the the uh, bunker that ah. <laughs> you like that it was beating up the uh, the bunker that uh, we had on a ten foot leader which was too short but we weren't in thresher territory and the, the bunker swam away from it and he went and ate it and his fork was at the balloon when wow. he ate. So wow. 10 feet of real shark. And uh, he didn't even know he was hooked. I reeled him right to the boat. And, you know, in hindsight, should have darted him, floated the, the, the poly ball and handled it that way. But instead I was like, I'm going to open 23 foot sea craft. This fish is going to beat the crap out of us all. Yeah. And we're probably going to die. So let's not deal with this just yet. And uh, he sounded and Beat the mono to a pulp and yeah. see you later. Yeah, you know, you know why I failed with that Mako on my boat, the one Mako I ever heard on my boat because it, it jumped. No, it didn't jump. Okay. But we were using mono rigs. We were using uh, like three hundred pound mono circle hook. Twelve rigs miles off, you had to be a little surprised because we were, to see we were brown sharking and you know, it, it, it catch and release with the brown sharks and the duskies or whatever. You get more bites on mono. At least we always used to. We had we had and that day we'd hooked zero sharks. Zero. It was it was the slowest day I've ever had. That usually means a, a big boy or, or an apex predator is in the yeah, area. And we had we had bluefish fillets out, and uh, we were talking earlier about starting with New Jersey angler Darren Doris, who taught me tons. Darren was the host of their show, taught me tons about offshore when I was fledgling, and we called it. We're like, all right, let's we're done here. It's been six hours. We've been bobbing around out here. We can't even catch a brown shark. And he goes cranking in those bluefish fillets at Mach 1, gets them off off the top. Mako comes in and eats them right behind my outboard and goes airborne. And he's 10 feet in the air, 10 feet off my outboard. And we're going, holy shit. And I had a flying gaff. I had the whole nine. 
and we had him up, and we botched the flying gaff shot. So he went back down, and we're like, "All right, now we're ready." We tweaked what we needed to tweak because it caught us completely off guard. And like he was right there, he was two feet away from getting stuck. And I saw him shake his head and just cut that mon. <laughs> Every mako that uh, that was almost seems to have come off uh, on the jump because it is almost impossible unless it's happened two or three times and you have preconditioned yourself for that being in awe. Yeah. Because every time a Mako jumps, your jaw hits the ground yeah. and you forget to reel. And you slack off and the thing cartwheels and that's all she wrote. Yeah. The, the only jumping Mako I encountered was we were chunking tuna at night and we hooked one on one of the chunk rods and I'm fighting it on one side of the boat and you heard it leave the water on, <laughs> on the, the other, other side, side of the boat. <laughs> and I remember, like, they're like, it jumped, it jumped. And you've seen enough videos now. I mean, this you hadn't seen as many of them then, but mm -hmm. of Mako's jumping into the boat. And nothing scared me more. I remember being terrified, being like, this thing is out there in the black, jumping, and I have no idea where it That'd is. That'd be kind yeah. of unsettling. So. It's funny, though, because you bring up sharking as a, as a bait and wait kind of game. And, and it is. You're right about that. But to me, it was always it was very different from from bow finning or catfishing because I feel like when you're catfishing, especially even if you're not catching the big blue or the big flathead you want, there's always some kind of action. There's always something nibbling, something going on, and you just kind of feel the feels differently. Whereas offshore shark fishing is the most boring thing on the entire planet Earth. Second most. Unless it's giant going to. Giant tuna fishing is probably the most boring. I, I have no experience with giants. You boys have a lot Ugh. more experience with giants, but I imagine it's very much it the same thing. It sucks until it happens. <laughs> when it happens, it's oh, the man. bomb. But until then, the whole like, I, I don't think I've ever been on one sh offshore shark trip where within the first half hour of no bites, somebody's like, See, told you we should have went tuna fishing. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I'm no. Like, no, I want my Mako, please. Because yeah. you, you're, yeah. you're reluctant to leave that chum slick, yeah. I think. Once, once you, you establish it, it, you don't you're know what's out there. It. Yeah. You're married yeah. to it. There's something about just once you set that chum. Like, I love the chumming aspect of bait fishing, too. Um, it, you know, going down to, like, chumming grass shrimp in the back bays, mm -hmm. but especially shark, uh, big sharking. I've only done offshore sharking once. And um, I remember we caught a ton of blue sharks and one pup Mako. But uh, you guys... Have, did a lot of that, like getting the big five gallon buckets, and th th that I feel like it's really lost. But even before when I, was in, when I was in college, when I was in college, Jim, I used to get big five gallon buckets full of goat's blood. <laughs> Did you really? And go full jaws. That's nah. awesome. I swear to God, there's a halal meat market right across the river here in Trenton, New Jersey, and this is for people who are like judging me right now, but just let me explain. This is back in the day when uh, I mean I was I was a new boat owner and I was like learning all this offshore stuff. And then also, this is, uh, I was probably 19 or so, and this is just when you started hearing these whispers and rumors about guys catching brown sharks in the surf. That wasn't that big a deal around here back then, the way it is now. It was just sort of this like very underground thing. And uh, like a dum-dum, I always just took the Jaws route, and I'm like, well, nothing calls them in like warm-blooded mammal blood, <laughs> right? And dynamite. So I, uh, I, got this, I got this wild hair, me and a couple buddies. I'm like, I got this idea. I know how we're going we're gonna to catch some sharks. I know what we're going to do. So I called this, this halal meat market in Trenton, and uh, I'm like, hi, sir. Uh, I was wondering. He's like, you need blood? Come in and get blood. I'm like, okay. He's like, bring your own bucket. Great. So I show up at this place with a five gallon bucket and like <laughs> goats and stuff are screaming in the next room and it was free. He didn't even charge me. It was a full five gallon bucket of blood and hair. Dude, the entire bucket was radiating warm. I mean, that is how fresh the blood was. <laughs> oh right. And I, I, I screwed an eye bolt into it and then froze it. And then, then we took it out on the end of the North Jetty in Barnegat in July in the middle of the night. You did this from shore? Uh, I did it from the boat and from shore. And I, I look, I'll jump ahead. And I'll jump ahead. I'll, I'll get to the punchline. Both from shore and from the boat, goat's blood produced no sharks. So it's not like this magic thing. If you think this is like, oh, cow blood or pig blood or something is just like 
so good it's it's cheating because they say and i know back in the day at least in shark tournaments you could not use mammal blood that was a rule it was a rule that was a rule you yeah. could not use mammal blood right you had to use fish chum or whatever so naturally it must have been the yeah, best it must chum. Be, yeah. Best. yeah no it is not at all <laughs> uh we just wasted two trips to the halal Crazy meat market on their we tried it for threshers once off my boat many years ago and i caught bluefish bluefish love goat blood <laughs> right and same thing but we we, we just hucked the whole thing off the end of the north jetty at barnegat uh back when i was in college and we did it very late at night and then it, but it was july and we caught nothing but bluefish again like cocktail blues i don't even know if they were there for the blood gym they might have just been there naturally <laughs> but just like their natural environment and then like the sun started coming up and like people started showing up for beach activities for the day in july and i was like <laughs> we need to leave because if there's a shark attack of any kind today we're, we're in, we've just we're been streaming goat's blood with an outgoing tide down island beach state park since about four o'clock in the morning so um don't Fish recommend it but you know fishermen are so weird if you I don't know, know dude you all yeah, yeah it's you know um but i feel like that offshore sharking with the chum and going out there before the Makos were protected, that had already lost a lot of its popularity. Like it, it's, I, I feel like around 2000, 2005, people were crazy. Cause I used to work at Fanatics Bait and Tackle right. in Ocean City. Right. And we would move through buckets of bunker chum and mackerel chum yeah. all through June. And you, I, you don't hear people doing it. You don't hear the reports as much anymore. I did it the most, you know, I worked at Saltwater Sportsman. I worked at Saltwater Sportsman for a time and uh, for a few years. And I think I, I would say I did it most like 2005 through 2009, like in that era. And I, I had a couple good friends with bigger boats who were much older and had more money than me. And I was lucky enough to be part <laughs> of their crews. Um, and we sugar were sugar captains. We, yeah, we had sugar captains. And we were not overly successful. But I don't know if in that era I, I could say. It got less popular, uh, or did it get less popular? Because I feel like if you read like Pete Barrett, who I believe writes for On the Water, mm -hmm. if you read his shark books from the '80s and stuff in New Jersey, uh, that, that was like dog fishing. There were so many makos that if you wanted fresh mako steaks, it was not that difficult. You didn't have to go that far. You didn't have to work that hard. So was it was it really getting less popular, or did the fishery dry up? The fishery yeah. was already drying up then. We just didn't really know it yet, kind of thing, um, you know. And, and and people may think less of me for this, and and you know, fair to say that I am I am a truly conservation minded angler. Like I I really am. But there's also a part of me like that like that kid in me still that wants to go to the Gulf and catch and kill one six hundred plus pound mako. Just to say I did it and never do that again. I don't want to kill 20 of them. I don't want to kill two of them. But as as a kid growing up who was enamored with Jaws, there's dude, there's Jaws posters in here. I got a great white tattoo on my leg. That was always my dream was to have one stupid jaw set from a really big Mako that I caught. Just one. Just one. And I, I sort of fell out of shark fishing and the opportunity went away and now the rules have changed. And now, you know, if you go to the Gulf, you go to Southern California, I think they're protected in Southern California too. But even in the Gulf, that's pretty uncommon. There's a lot of big Makos in the Gulf. Those boys just tend to not mess with them. They just don't want anything to do with them, Dude. you know? Would, would a poor beagle jaw do it for you or does it have to be a Mako? I would I would accept the poor beagle jaw, Jim. Because jo I mean, you. Cheech has one. He'll sell you for twenty dollars. <laughs> I got one for sale. You want? Um, <laughs> no, but he went out on a uh, on a groundfish trip. Yeah. And you guys caught a ton of. Uh, which was did the shark come first or the uh, groundfish? Well, it was a tall order. I had I had, I, I traded out an elk hunt in Utah. You and went elk hunting? I haven't yet. I haven't cashed that ticket yet. But. Um, so this guy wanted to come out with his whole family, a buddy basically. trip, not like a not like with a oh, guy. So, so, he, you know, a friend so, of his says, so he he shows up on my doorstep. In a like a, a full on Winnebago, and mm. there's like five of them from Utah, and their mandate was we want to bring 500 pounds of fresh fillets home. The sound is cooked. There isn't any sea bass. There's no fluke in the sound. I'm like, I got my work cut out for me. So yeah, I sent them on a party boat. I'm hoping that they can get some stuff done. Long story short, I get down to day five of this trip, and they have like 
a hundred pounds of fillets. Uh, so I call. It seems like plenty. <laughs> I call. They're from Utah. They pay like thirty nine dollars for frozen halibut and like fifteen dollars for tilapia. Go figure. So I'm like. I call in the ace, right? Probably the best fisherman on the eastern seaboard, this guy Willie Hatch. And um, I'm like, Willie, I need to put some meat in the boat. These guys want like 400 pounds of fillets. Can you help me? He's like, all right, I got you. We're going to go and we're going to knuckle a big poor beagle first. Maybe we'll have a shot at a tuna. But once we get the poor beagle, we'll ground fish. We'll pound on the haddock and the uh, and the pollock and get some codfish, and we'll fill the boat. And he's got like a thirty something foot JC. So we go out there, and right off the bat, we get like a four hundred and fifty pound poor beagle. Things mm. look like a great white. I, I'm massive. Su- I'm super intrigued by those sharks. Right, make no mistake. I think they're very cool, and I would very much like to catch cartoon one. cartoon characters. But as far to as your to your go. earlier point about you know you've been in Louisiana for redfish, you've been to Florida, you want a local red fish my dream was one big ass local mako Mako's, so to be able to go that was a new jersey yes that, that swam just off new one, jersey just one i don't want people to think i'm greedy you know like i look at the striper regs and things yep. i don't really keep any stripers anymore i did for years i don't anymore i get it same thing with makos i think these regs are good but damn it i just wanted my one just second my one. angriest fish in the sea yeah I, I'm like like no bullshit i don't want to mess with a 600 pound mako Boat side. Well, I don't want to be it, that it, guy that has to it, it, it's subdue funny. that piece. It, it's funny you say that, uh, and and this is certainly not a representation of all the Louisiana captains, but the few that I know that I've talked to, I've brought this up before. I'm like, man, you guys have these huge makos out there where you're tuna fish and stuff, and they're all like, I ain't messing with that thing. Like they just don't want anything to do with it. They are they don't possessed by the devil. Yeah, they don't want to beat up their boats. They don't want to have to deal yeah. with it. Um, yeah, I mean, yes, it's a food, which is funny to me because Makos are delicious. Oh my God. The dudes in the Gulf are about delicious things. Uh, they just have this sort of stigma. It's like almost this unwritten rule of like, you don't mess with that. Now, could I find somebody who would let me mess with one if I really wanted one? Probably. But day over day, if you're watching, you and I have been, Jim, you and I have been to Venice Marina in Southern Louisiana, tuna fishing together. Keep an eye out for how many people hang Makos at that dock. It's very few. Hmm. Makos is a fierce animal, man. Yeah, I know it. I get. I think a lot of captains at this point kind of have that, like, I will, I'll leave you alone, you leave me alone with like, right. the sharks. I, I, my good friend uh, Rob Taylor says that. I, I was out uh, giant tuna fishing with him this year. We caught four thresher sharks while fishing for giant tuna. Yeah. And um, I was like, do you ever keep these? He goes... I don't, it goes, I, I, we, we have a truce. We have a truce here. I, I don't want them to mess with me. He goes, <laughs> you know, I, I'm not going to mess with them. I'll let them right. go. They are very cool sharks up close, too. Cool. I think I think Thresher's are probably my favorite shark. And I caught my first one, but it wasn't, I mean, you guys talk about how, how well they fight. I, I caught it on a 130 lockdown for, for giant tuna, and that was not much I, of a I, I've never I've never caught a, like a gigundo, right? I've, I've caught some just keepers back in the day. Uh, but when I, when I ran my boat out of Barnegat, um, in both spring and fall striper season, I always had at least an 80 wide. I had this old piece of crap like beat international 80 (laughs) wide, but it was always in the cabin because the amount of times that you'd be fishing the bunker for stripers and all of a sudden, and I hadn't seen it in years until um, just this fall, as a matter of fact, um, we were out fishing with my my buddy Eric Kerber. You know know Eric Mm -hmm. Kerber. And uh, my buddy Ross Robertson, the walleye guy, he's a walleye guy on Erie, was in town. And we had this, this rock'em, sock'em day striper fishing. And it's getting towards the end of the day, and we're in this bunker school, and it gets, qu- it gets quiet. All of a sudden, it's like nothing's going on. Where did the bass go? What has happened here? And all of a sudden, man, whap, 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 here comes that tail right <laughs> Something through the real middle. Showed up. And you're like, you're all going nuts. You're like, wow, wow, you know. But now we have no 80 wide. We're all just fishing striper gear. So even if it happened, it probably wouldn't have ended well. But for many years, I uh, I, I, I kept a shark rod on my boat just in case, just in case. it popped up. Um, same thing, man. Again, all about shark conservation. But threshers are delicious. Like I, I, I Keeping one a season, probably all I would do. But I, I would take that one, man. It's better than swordfish, in my opinion. Yeah, well, let, let's rephrase that. A fresh caught mako or thresher is better than store bought or restaurant bought swordfish. Agree. I would day, agree with that. Any 100%. day. But 
fresh caught swordfish will blow your mind. Yeah, it's incredible. Although I've had it, in, I, I've I've been down to Florida and they get all hot on the pumpkin thing. You know what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah, yeah. Is, is that is that a thing in the Northeast, Jim? Yeah, I don't even it's, know. It's, it's a higher percentage popular. down south. So you you have a lot. I, I forget what it is. I'm going to mess it up. It might be one in twenty up in the Northeast, maybe one in fifty, and then down in Florida, it's like one in eight. Yeah. Right. So and it's because they're feeding on on a type of shrimp. Any yeah. Nebraska who we work with knows uh, knows more about the pumpkin swordfish, and they claim it tastes tastes a lot better. I've Sweeter. had it. I've had it in the Keys. I I didn't see it, but whatever. I played along. I was like, mm, pumpkin. Yeah, yeah. I get uh, it, but. Swordfish is also, they're like filthy with worms, some of them. Yeah, I mean, uh, all I know is like a I'm sword, not knocking a sword, it, it's good, a sword but... coming back from a day trip or an overnight is totally different from what you get from the from the fishmonger or from the restaurant. It It's noticeably different. And, and, sto- and, and a fresh-caught mako or thresher is better than what you get the, at the fishmonger or restaurant. While we're talking about fish we eat. Do you ever eat any of the catfish you catch up here? You know, I have not yet done that, and I, I certainly that surprises me, Joe. Ah, man, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna get me off on a thing here. Uh, I, I've thought about it, and there's no reason why I wouldn't, because I the Delaware River is cleaner than it's 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 been in decades, right? It's one of the cleanest rivers. Uh, to me, it's it's more a um, a longstanding thing of I like freshwater fish. But there's none of it that is as good as saltwater fish. And growing up coastal, I always have some mahi, some yep. tog, maybe some tuna or whatever in my freezer. So I just don't. Fair it's enough. Not, it's not that I dislike catfish. It's not that I dislike crappie or walleye. I will never be as excited about eating that as the, the saltwater options we have so close. In my travels, I've done it. I've done the crappie fry in Alabama. I've done the catfish fry, you know, in in Texas and in Virginia, and I'm all for it. Locally, though, um, I yeah, I, I I would, but I don't. If that makes sense, let's do it. I want to do it. I want to eat some catfish. I, I want to eat some catfish. I want to fry up some catfish. Well, dude, come on down this spring and shoot shoot an episode of something. Yeah, you, you guys have done good. shad episodes in the past. I'll float you. We'll do cats and shad and stripers in the same day. Because we did that this year just for fun. I took one of the shad we caught and caught a pool winning. Uh, I remember that. Oh, Jim, Jim, Jim and Jim. I shad. I, I, I sneak that in wherever I can. We were less than two <laughs> miles from where we're sitting right now when Jim caught those shad that you then took out as was, bait on you a party boat. You caught the shad. It was a big row. Yeah. And then we cut up some of the smaller bucks and uh, used them for catfish. And I hooked a catfish. And I, I was... A little skeptical. You're like, oh no, man, they pull hard, and there's some big ones here, and I'm I'm expecting small little dinky no, channels. No, there's big channels I, here. I fought one. I lost. Ended up losing it, and man, it it pulled. Yeah, pulled hard. I mean, I, I wanted you to pour water on the reel like Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> I want to I want to do some catfishing, and I, I want to do some snakeheads. Well, here's a proposal. I'll call you out on your own podcast. Ooh. I got a guy in Williamsburg, Virginia, who does it all winter. You guys want to do a little little winter escape road trip in like I have I have January, free passes January February we can get after it although the offer is always on the table if you want to do something with Channel Cats man it is it is pretty easy and it is pretty fun and especially in in the April May time frame you have elevated flows so on top of which you're fighting a 15 pounder like in some real flows it's a it's a very good time but I am one of the things I love about catfish is that they do bite all winter. So if, if you guys are at all interested in doing like a Virginia trip I'd over the winter, that. dude, I'll, I'll I'll arrange it. I would love to go. I'd be down. That'd for be that. fun, man. I've yeah. been seeing I've seen those pictures that you catch of the giant catfish. I would love to get a big blue. Only if I can yeah. cook it. I want to catch a big blue too. Uh, that like awesome. channel cats sound like they're badass. I want to catch a big blue. Yeah, you, dude, you can come take as many as you want. We can cook as many as you want as you want. I I. I don't want to make it sound like I'm like snubbing my I'm not snubbing my nose at catfish. I dude, I've dealt with this my entire career everywhere. At Meat Eater, at Field and Stream, like people are always like, "Oh, you caught a smallmouth? Did you eat it?" I'm like, "No. Oh. Why?" Cuz I don't have to. Like yeah. I <laughs> If it was the only option, if that was your best option nah, for fresh correct. fish was, was catfish, correct. then it's you'd not. eat that. I but live too close to the coast. Exactly. You know, no, I, I, I have other options, you know. 
But Joe, uh, I want to say thank you very much for first off hosting us here Dude, to record this, is, this, this episode has been of the podcast. Great, man. Yeah, I'm I, glad. I'm glad you guys great. were here. And before we go, tell us a little bit about Cut and Retie. What is the the new evolution of uh, Joe Cermelli's podcast? Uh, wh- what is it like? Tell us about it, and uh, yeah. also where to find it. So, so Cut and Retie. Um, if, if anybody out there has been has been listening to my past stuff, uh, you know the Bent podcast that was on the Meat Eater Network, kind of sounded like a '90s radio show. Very segmented. Very fast. Uh, and prior to that, I had the Hookshots podcast, which was much more long form, like we're doing now, where we, we have a good conversation. And uh, through those two things, I heard from a lot of people like, well, we love the long form. Bent is too choppy. And there were a lot of people who were like, well, Bent is really great. So Cut and Retie, I think, is sort of the perfect marriage of the two of those. And uh, my whole deal, if you're into technical, don't listen to Cut and Retie because I'm just not technical. Uh, I love the fishing culture. As you know, I love fishy people, the fishing community. And just fishy cultures in general. So um, I'll teach you something, but I'm going to entertain you while I'm doing it. So we uh, just try and have a good time on Cut and Retie, have a little bit of fun with uh, a couple pop-up segments. And uh, so far, it's been, a, it's been a great time, man. And you can find that anywhere you want to, right? I, inevitably, there's always that one guy who's like, are you on pod select selection pods? I'm like, <laughs> I... <laughs> You're the only guy that listens there, man. <laughs> but for the most part, Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Music, Amazon Music, Google Play, it's cut and reties everywhere. And where can we find you on Instagram? At Joe Cermelli138. Awesome, man. Well, thank you very much. Make sure you listen to the cut and retie with me and Anthony on there. It's been fun. That's Thanks, my Joe. mama. And- <laughs>